Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, as always. I always start this off by saying uh, thanks for joining, giving it a moment for those of you to join us today. Hope everybody's having a great week. We have a really special presenter that I'm really excited to introduce today. Uh, before that, I also want to do a quick promo. Uh, this is the first of three series on really public health advocacy that we're doing. Uh, the first two are focused on reproductive rights. Uh, and then the third one will be focused on gun violence. Next week, we have Dr. Uh, Bernadette Myler, uh, who is a professor at Stanford and an expert in law, and really the expert in law at, at Stanford University, who's going to be talking about some of the implications of Roe and Wade. And then next week, we have Dr. Parsonette, who's going to be hosting um, a, a panel discussion with Dr. Barnhurst from UC Davis and Dr. Studdard uh, from Stanford as well, so a law professor here uh, about gun violence. Both have done a lot of research in gun violence, and uh, we'll talk more on that. But focusing on today, I'm really, really excited to welcome Dr. Caitlin Myers. Dr. Caitlin Myers is a John G. McCullough Professor of Economics at Middlebury College. She's the co-director of Middlebury, Middlebury Initiative for Data and Digital Methods. Research, she's a research fellow for the Institute of uh, Study of Labor. She received her BA in Economics and Latin American Studies at Tulane University in 1999 and a PhD in Economics at the University of Texas at Austin in 2005. Uh, Dr. Myers' research, and I'm, I'm going to say I pulled this directly from Wikipedia and, and a lot of great stuff talk, talking about her online. Dr. Myers' research examines issues related to gender, race, fertility, and the economy. Her research work is known for her research and the impact on contraception and abortion policies in the United States. In, in 2001, when the new Supreme Court agreed to hear Dobbs v. Jackson's Women's Health Organization case, she led an effort to compile the best economic research on the impact of abortion access on women's lives into the amicus brief, which was signed by more than 150 economists. Uh, Dr. Uh, Myers is extensively published. I certainly don't, don't wanna take up too much time going through all the different uh, publications she's done specifically in the topic she's going to be talking about today, um, including uh, measuring the travel distance of abortions on uh, birth, which she's gonna be talking to us today. She has an active paper that's about to be published as well on the cooling off or burden uh, the effects of mandatory waiting periods on abortions or births. She has countless publications and uh, work in this space. Um, she has been in the press. If you, you you may have even seen or heard of her name, she's been in the press so much, including the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, just the name of few. And uh, and uh, she's been really all over giving presentations along these topics in many academic uh, environments, including at Stanford. She was just at Stanford in May, uh, and so we're so excited to have her. She's here to talk about measuring the burden, the effect of travel distance on the instance of abortions and births. And I just want to say a special thank you to Dr. Myers. We actually, when she came to Stanford and we heard about her, she was on our top of our list to invite for grand rounds, but we had all the grand rounds scheduled. And we surprisingly had an opening today and I reached out to her immediately just less than two weeks ago and from across the world working in a, uh, a cafe, she responds to me within hours and says, no problem, I'm happy to join. And so really on last minute notice, despite being so well sought after, particularly now more than ever, she agreed to come uh, speak with us today. So Dr. Myers, thank you so much for being here today. I'll just remind everybody, please uh, put in your questions as she speaks at any time and we'll try to get them as soon as possible. Dr. Myers, I'll turn it over to you. And thanks again for being here. Oh my gosh, thanks for that very nice introduction. And it is my pleasure. Let me share my screen. Um, have a thumbs up, did that work, Errol? Excellent. You see in the slides, they look good? Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, I was really excited to come talk to y'all, uh, partly because my work benefits enormously from, I know this is going to sound cliche, but I really mean it from interdisciplinary perspectives. I need to talk to healthcare providers to understand what are some of the most pertinent questions I should be asking, what should I be considering as I design models. And so it really benefits me too to have opportunities like this outside of my own field of economics. And because I made the uh, kind of ill advised decision to take a trip in June, and then I got COVID right after I got back. I've been kind of um, lying low a little bit, and this is my first academic talk post reversal, and it's a it's certainly a moment to start talking about what what we're likely about to see. So I gave a version of this talk at Stanford in May, 
Uh, and I'm going to show you the title slide, although I've updated the figures with some evidence that got released in June, but um, the title slide that I used in May. This is a common way for me to start a talk on abortion. I'll riff on this old uh, kind of stale Democratic Party platform. I think it uh, originates in the 1990s Clinton campaign that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. And I have for years started talks by kind of letting people know that abortion uh, is safe, that abortion was legal, uh, and that abortion is not rare in the United States. So with our most recent available statistics from the Guttmacher Institute, which were just released a couple of weeks ago, they estimated that in 2020, there were an estimated 930,000 induced abortions in clinical settings in the US. That is about 21% of all pregnancies. So about a fifth of all pregnancies in the US ended in induced abortion in 2020. That's about one and a half percent of all US women of reproductive age, which I'll define as 15 to 44 following the norm, um, having an abortion in that year alone. And if you are willing to take the age profile of abortion patients in 2020 and kind of extrapolate from that to estimate, assume that the age profile of abortions is going to remain constant, which I think is kind of a big assumption, but let's call it a thought experiment. If you're willing to make that extrapolation, then about one in four American women who are of reproductive age right now, age 15 to 44, would have an abortion by the time they reach age 45. So it's about one in four women. So that's a really big number. And usually I present that to just ground people in the fact that abortion isn't rare. But now I feel like I have to amend this slide because of course abortion is no longer legal everywhere either. Um, as I'm sure everybody knows, the US Supreme Court issued a decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health on June 24th that overturned Roe v. Wade. And in the aftermath of that decision, we're seeing abortion bans play out fairly predictably across states. Some are already in effect, some are currently being litigated, some are being legislated, but we're seeing it play out so that you know, abortion is no longer legal everywhere. So just to kind of ground you a little bit more in this legal moment, this Dobbs decision is the third of, it depends on who's counting, but I think by my count, it's the third landmark US Supreme Court ruling on abortion. The first would be Roe v. Wade in 1973 that established a constitutional right to privacy protecting abortion and that states could not ban pre-viability abortions. The second was Planned Parenthood v. Casey in 1992, which was a moment when the court really seemed poised to overturn Roe. There was a moment in 1992 where a lot of people thought it was about to happen and it was a, it was almost a it was a surprise for a lot of people that by a narrow majority, they actually upheld Roe. And in that case, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the court did revise in a really important way the legal standard under which state restrictions on abortion were evaluated. And they moved from a strict scrutiny framework. And since I'm not a lawyer, I'm an economist, so like my version of strict scrutiny uh, lawyers laugh at, but here's my version. Strict scrutiny framework, it's really, really hard. The states have a very high bar to clear if they want to regulate abortion. They moved away from that framework to an undue burden. They introduced this whole new standard, undue burden, and that became the new framework. And the undue burden standard said, look, states could have a legitimate interest in regulating health care. Of course they could, right? It's states regulate health care all the time. What courts need to do is balance any legitimate interest the state has in regulating abortion with a particular set of laws against this question of whether those laws impose an undue burden on people seeking abortion, which the court defined as a substantial obstacle in the path of people seeking abortion. So it was with Casey that we moved to the standard where courts were, it's a, it's a fairly vague standard, frankly, from my opinion, where the courts are supposed to decide if a particular, uh, if a particular law is preventing a substantial number of people from, from getting abortions. And then of course, in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health on June 24th, the court just said, we're overruling them both, right? Like they're returning regulatory power to the states. Uh, and of course, there's going to be litigation. We're going to, I'm sure there's going to continue to be kind of a storm of litigation trying to figure out what that means under federal and state constitutions, but, but that's where we are. So 
Prior to Dobbs, I had already worked as a consultant for Planned Parenthood and the Center for Reproductive Rights, and this is a, a disclosure of that uh, that in that interest. Um, primarily, my job was, and I am very intent on having it always be this way. My job is not advocacy. My job is to come in as a scientist and measure things, and in particular, when the standard was undue burden, my standard my job was to measure how many people seeking abortions were likely to be prevented from obtaining abortions due to state regulations. Now, that standard is now out the window, so I, I don't really think I'm going to be I'm going to be doing that anymore, but uh, I, I may still be involved. Um, it kind of depends on what the, the legal needs are and what evidence the courts needs uh, in these cases. Um, also, as Errol mentioned, I spearheaded the economist amicus brief in Dobbs. That's not paid. There's no financial interest. That's a public service. Um, but if you're interested, you can just Google the brief and find it. Or I have a version for the for Brookings that's like a shorter version of it. It's also been covered in the press. That brief really focuses on the assertion Mississippi made to the court, which was that Roe, they, they made two contradictory assertions. The first was, there's no way to know if abortion access affects anybody's lives. And the second was, abortion access doesn't affect anybody's lives. And I personally think those are contradictory and you need to pick one. But in any event, they're both wrong. We do have really good objective scientific evidence of the causal effects of abortion access on people's lives. And we know that it is substantial. And so that's really what The Economist Brief is about. But today in talking to you, uh, because I have limited time, I will really be focusing on one particular question. And in some ways it's a bit narrow, but in other ways it's the jumping off point for everything that's about to happen in this country. So I think it's, it's a good place to start. So I'm gonna be talking about how changes in travel distance that are going to arise from these state bans and provider closures are likely to affect abortion and birth rates in the US. Really seeking to answer the question, as states go dark, how many people are going to be able to get out and travel to the states where provider remain, providers remain? And how many people are likely to remain trapped where they are by poverty, by lack of childcare, by domestic violence, by all the factors that can make vulnerable and marginalized um, and poor communities face particular obstacles to traveling to obtain medical care. So my goal here is to try to get a count of what it's about to happen. And my methodology really can be broken down into three steps. The first is take what we know about where providers were on May 1st. I'll talk in a second about why I'm choosing May 1st. Uh, to calculate baseline travel distances. The second step is going to be to model the closures of facilities in states that are likely to ban and recalculate travel distances. And the third state is to use what we know about the cause, the third step is to use what we know about the causal effects of travel distance to project how many people get trapped. And as you can imagine, it's the third, the third step's a doozy, right? Like the third step is the, the really hard one, but let me start with the two pretty straightforward ones. And actually, I shouldn't even say they're, I don't want to suggest they're not hard because they involve a lot of time, but they're straightforward at least. Uh, so step one is to calculate current travel distances. And what I'm relying on to do that is a database that I have constructed that provides information on where all U.S. abortion providers are. Um, and it's actually a panel. So it's every provider that's publicly identifiable, meaning you can find them in a, in a phone book if you search abortion, or you can find them on the internet if you're searching for an abortion provider. They're publicly advertising. Um, so every provider, every publicly identifiable provider since January 1st of 2009 is in this database. And the screenshot I am showing you says vintage March 1st, 2022, but I'm updating it um, like every two weeks right now, actually, I have code scrapes online directories. I have students who are calling all the providers once a month. So I'm and I'm in contact with a lot of them. So it's actually up to date. Uh, and this is restricted data, but if you you can apply to use it if you have like legitimate academic needs for it. The documentation is pretty huge. It's like 500 pages. And the documentation is just a provider by provider account of everything. I know about their operations and citations. 
So all of this is available at Open Science Framework. If you go to Open Science Framework, you can download the information to apply for the restricted use database, or you can apply for county by month panels of travel distance, or you could just download county by month panels of travel distances right now. Those are not restricted. They don't identify the providers in any way, but what they do is identify for every U.S. county just how far is it to the nearest provider. So the way I calculate that is for every county in the U.S., I start with its population centroid, which you can roughly think of as a measure of where the average person lives in that county. It's, it's a measure that takes into account the distribution of population across a county. And from that population centroid, I'm using the HERE API, uh, which is a lot like Google Maps, to calculate a driving distance based on existing road networks to the geo coordinates of the nearest open provider in miles. And this map shows you on May 1st, 2022, each dot is a provider that was open then, and each county is shaded according to how far it is to the nearest provider. And the reason I chose May 1st as a baseline is that Oklahoma actually began enforcing an abortion ban in May that closed all of its providers. And it wasn't technically constitutional under Roe, but they were allowed to enforce it. And so if I if I even used June 1st, Oklahoma would already have gone dark. But I really think of Oklahoma going dark as they were just jumping the gun, but it was the first step into a post-Roe America. So that's why I'm gonna use May 1st as a baseline. So you can see that most women in the US uh, are within about 25 miles of an abortion provider or uh, within about, yeah, so the average woman in the U.S. at this time is about 27 miles from the nearest provider. Uh, less than 1% of women are more than 200 miles from a provider. That would be like the really dark shading. Of course, you see it running across the swath of the middle of America, but they're just not very populated counties. So it's not a large fraction of the population. OK, so that's where we were at the beginning of May. And then my next step is going to be to model the closures of the providers where we expect to see abortion bans. And we have a pretty good idea of where we expect to see abortion bans. First off, we're already watching them play out, right? Like if you're just following the news, they're going into effect, they're being litigated. Louisiana had one that went into effect, then enforcement was enjoined, then it went back into effect, then yesterday enforcement was enjoined. And like, there's gonna be litigation like this, but when the dust settles, what are what's the country likely to look like? So I'm going to rely on forecasts from the Center for Reproductive Rights and Guttmacher for that. They both have been publishing forecasts. They are super in sync. The couple of states where they're not in sync, they both agree are just gray areas. But the approach I'm going to take is to say, OK, I'm going to model 25 states as highly likely to ban abortion. 13 of them because they have trigger bans. Trigger bans were written to go into effect when or shortly after Roe re was reversed. And the other 12 states, um, based on their existing legislation, le legislation and the composition, like their governors uh, and their legislators, and whether they still have some pre-Roe bans on the books, are being forecast to be really likely to start enforcing bans soon. And in fact, these were forecasts that Guttmacher and Center for Productive Rights had made before the reversal. And these are states that one or both said were highly likely to ban, to be clear. Um, and I'm highlighting here in red the ones that are enforcing a ban as of today, like right now. Um, so a bunch of them have already started banning. The ones that aren't in red, a lot of them have are like Louisiana engaged in, a, in litigation over their ban, but they're pretty likely to go into effect soon. Some of them, like Ohio, are already enforcing a six-week gestational age ban, and their legislature legislators are like writing a bill to enforce a total ban very soon. So it's kind of it's all happening. Let's model what the country looks like when or if all 25 states ban. So in this map, all the red, the states that are outlined in red are states where I'm modeling a ban taking effect. The dots that have turned red are abortion facilities that have closed and travel distance has been recalculated. And in this scenario, 54% of US women of reproductive age are predicted to experience an increase in travel distance. Now I'm gonna hone in on those women 
who, and I'm using census data, actually I'm talking about women here because I'm using census data and counting women in it. Um, so I am going to kind of hone in on those women who are experiencing that change, which in statistical terms is a conditional expectation, conditional on being in this group, what do things look like? So for this group, they already had travel distances that were higher than the national average. So on May 1st, this group already faced travel distances of an average of 33 miles, as opposed to 27 miles for the country as a whole. But they're predicted to increase, the average woman in this group is gonna experience an increase from 33 miles to 282 miles is the prediction. 70% of these women are going to end up more than 200 miles from the nearest provider. And the question is, what happens next? How many of them get out? And as you can imagine, if I could just pause and editorialize in a very qualitative and unlike me way, if you could just imagine the personal stories that are playing out, like right, right now in these banned states, there are people seeking abortions like me. Well, I'm not seeking an abortion right now. Uh, there are people seeking abortions who, like me, have high levels of education, high levels of income, and they're like, oh, I need medical care, and I'm going to have to travel 600 miles round trip to get it. That's really rough. I am super unhappy about it, but yeah, I'm going to do it, right? Like, they can do it. There are people who are poor, who don't have credit, who don't have $100 in their bank account, who are parenting children, can't take time off of work, don't know what to do with the kids, haven't traveled distances like this, maybe they're in abusive relationships, for whom that same distance just looks like completely impossible to surmount. And they're scrambling and they're stressing. And the question just is like, how does this play out? So step three is going to take what we know about how popula the population as a whole responds to travel distance to project what fraction of people get out and what fraction don't. And this is the step that's gonna take almost the entire rest of the talk because this is where things get really complicated. Uh, and so, and I'm gonna have to have kind of a, a really big digression to talk about how it is that we know the things we know about travel distance. So, so bear with me. So, my training as an economist, I'm an applied microeconomist trained in the field of labor economics, but my secondary field is econometrics. If you have any economists in your life, if you know and love economists, you'll know that that is a, a incredibly uh, widely used field for applied microeconomists like me. Econometricians like me have really focused in the last 20 years on how to keep the science and social science how to take the ideals and practices of the scientific method and apply them to social questions. So if you're as a physician wanting to know, for instance, if a particular treatment is effective, you are really likely to be relying on evidence that's also estimated causal effects or what we might call treatment effects, the effect of an intervention on an outcome. But most of your evidence is going to come, not all, but a lot of it comes from randomized controlled trials. Like that's kind of the gold standard, right? So if you're wanting to test an intervention, you take a large group of subjects, you randomly assign some of them to receive treatment, you randomly assign the others to be in a placebo group, you follow them and see what happens, you compare their outcomes. And because they were randomly assigned treatment, you can infer that any differences in average outcomes is the average effect of the intervention, right? So. I am all about RCTs and I will, I teach them and I will run them when I can. In fact, I have run RCTs in, um, uh, in collaboration with Planned Parenthood to test information interventions to increase use of long acting reversible contraceptives, right? So I, I will run them when I can. But when we're talking about abortion policy, you pretty much can't run them, right? Like there's, there's no universe in which I, as a social science researcher, um, can or should go out into the world and say, hello, people seeking abortions. I am going to randomly assign some of you to have to drive 600 miles to get one and some of you to have to drive five. And then I'm gonna see what happens to your lives, right? Um, not feasible. Is it, you should roll your eyes that an economist would say not feasible. First, it's very like us. Um, obviously, even more importantly, not ethical. 
Um, so that's not what we do, but we don't just like throw up our hands when we're faced with a really important question that can't be answered with an RCT. What we do is look for other ways to get at causal inference. And very commonly what we're looking for is what we call a quasi or a natural experiment. This is a research design where economists can argue that treatment, while we as a researcher weren't able to randomly assign it, conditional on the controls we can add to the model, we can argue it's as good as randomly assigned. So let me give you a salient example. In 2013, Texas began enforcing some provisions of Texas HB2, which was a law regulating their abortion providers. And in particular, on November 1st, 2013, Texas began enforcing an admitting privileges requirement for abortion providers that many of the providers, and in Texas, they're all physicians, so none of the, many of the physicians could not meet. They did not have admitting privileges at nearby hospitals. They didn't admit patients to nearby hospitals. If a patient needed to go to a nearby hospital, they didn't particularly want the physician to come along with them. Um, and the hospitals didn't want to give them admitting privileges. And so unable to obtain these privileges, about half of Texas's abortion facilities closed overnight between October 31st and November 1st, 2013. A couple more went after, uh, as an anecdote, there was a 80 something year old provider in San Antonio who still had maintained admitting privileges at a Corpus Christi hospital. And to keep the Corpus Christi abortion facility open began commuting from San Antonio to Corpus Christi twice a week. But after a couple months of that, he was like, I cannot keep this up. And the facility had to close because they couldn't get new admitting privileges for somebody. So this is a map I made years ago for a paper that exploits uh, this natural experiment, because what we've got is a situation, the gray dots are providers that are closing in Texas, the counties are shaded according to increases in travel distance, and we have a situation where some parts of Texas are experiencing really large increases in travel distance, while other parts of Texas aren't experiencing as large of increases, and others aren't experiencing a change in all at all. And in fact, the challenge to this law went to the U.S. Supreme Court in a 2016 case, Whole Women's Health v. Hellerstedt. And during oral arguments in that case where this situation was being explained to the justices, Justice Kagan remarked, oh, it's almost like the perfect controlled experiment. And of course, like when I saw that transcript, I was like, I will use that quote for the rest of my career because yes, it is Justice Kagan. That's exactly right. And in fact, social scientists see it as such and are you know jumping on the opportunity to analyze it. The approach we use to analyze it is called difference in differences estimation. And some of you are probably familiar with what I will call diff and diff which is the, the slang for difference in differences. Some of you are probably familiar with it. Some of you aren't. The intuition for it, at least, is really easy, even if the implementation is a lot more complicated. So let me just start with the really simple intuition. Let's treat counties in Texas where travel distance went up as a treatment group. Treatment is the increase in travel distance. And let's suppose for those counties, we can see an outcome like their abortion rate before and after that happens. Well, the difference in their abortion rate, the change in their abortion rate is our starting point. Like, let's suppose we see that abortions went down in the counties where travel distance went up. That would be the first difference for the treatment group. But correlation isn't causation. And abortions were experiencing a secular decline in um, some parts of the country during those years. And actually not anymore, but, um, but during that time they were. And it could be that the treatment group was going to have a decrease in abortions, even if their providers had not shut. So what we need is a control group. And let's use the counties where travel distances didn't change as a control group. So the way I've drawn it, this is totally hypothetical, not based on real data, what I'm drawing right now, but the way I've drawn it, the control group also has a decline in abortions. It's just not as steep as the treatment group. And what we'll do is say, okay, to the extent that the treatment group's decline is greater than the control group, we will infer that that was due to the change in abortion access. It's over a very short period of time, keep in mind, there's not much room for other things to be going on. And we're just comparing two groups of counties and we're like, to the extent that the control group, which serves as our counterfactual, looks different, 
than the treatment group, we think the difference is explained by the change in abortion access by treatment. And so the difference in difference estimation is the difference in the change for the treatment group and the change for the control group. It's also sometimes called double dis difference. And I'll mention that this is used in RCTs all the time too. Um, if you're looking at a paper on an RCT and they collected baseline means and post-treatment means for the two groups and they're comparing them, it's diff, it's diff and diff too, right? So you see it in RCTs as well as in natural experiments. But in the natural experiment context, there's a whole lot more we throw at this. I'm going to show you one shock and awe model in a, in, a, in a minute to kind of talk about that. But let me just say we throw a lot more at it because it's a natural experiment, we have to really poke at it a lot more than an RCT. And in particular, we spend a lot of time investigating whether there was any difference in the trends for the two groups before treatment occurred. We spend a lot of time investigating dynamic changes in the trends after treatment occurred. And we spend a lot of time adding control variables for things like maybe poverty just happened to change differentially for one group compared to the other during exactly the same time. So we have to add all those controls in too. But the basic intuition is comparing changes for two groups. And it wasn't lost, of course, on social scientists that Texas was a natural experiment. And um, I'm only citing two of the papers, but actually there's four independent teams of researchers who immediately, like at almost the exact same time, jumped on this and started estimating what was happening. I'm citing the two papers that did, I think, the most rigorous job with the statistical analysis and got the clinic operations right because one of the papers really missed a lot of the closures which caused caused it to they've admitted this caused them to kind of underestimate some of the effects so the two papers that i'm citing find super similar effects in texas and i'll say they're not as simple as just saying oh distance went up distance didn't simple binary they're actually estimating the effect of distance and allowing it to change if we're talking about going from zero to 25 miles versus zero to 100 miles versus zero to 200 miles. They're actually quite flexible models. Um, what they estimate, the first paper estimates that going from zero to more than 100 miles prevents about 38% or it reduces observed abortions by about 38% and increases births by about 2%. But their estimated effect on births in particular is super imprecise. I'm in the second team of researchers, the Lindo et al. paper. We have a pretty similar estimated effect for abortion. Uh, reduces going from five to 105 miles reduces abortions by about 30%. We argue there's really not enough statistical power to be sure what's going on with births, right? Maybe they're going up, but we don't think you can really be sure in that context at that time. Since then, there was another team of researchers that did something really similar using clinic closures in Wisconsin. They weren't on any of the Texas papers. They were completely independent. They're using a different natural experiment and they got an very similar estimated effect on abortion rates. But there's still some questions kind of remaining from this literature. So first, is the evidence from Texas and Wisconsin externally valid? Would we see it anywhere? And second, because the estimated effects on births from those two states had huge standard errors, big confidence intervals, really imprecise, we really weren't very sure about the answer to the critical question, when we see people not reaching abortion providers, what is happening to them? Are they self-managing abortions and we're just not counting them? Are they giving birth? And so that's a really critical question that hadn't been answered. And so I have a new paper that, that resolves both of those questions while also projecting, using the result to project what the end of row is likely to bring. So we're still, of course, getting to that, right? This is my giant digression to, to go through the third step of my method to predicting what happens post row. So here's the basic approach I take in that new paper. I use my own database to create, and it's published, a county panel of travel distances. You can get it county by month. I'm using county by year because that meshes with the vital statistics. And if you look at, let me look at, let's actually look at more. So you know about this, you know about my database, uh, you know about travel, to, oh, what happened with that? It went to the wrong place. Sorry, give me one second to fix that. I need to show you a really cool map and I had a link that was set up wrong. One teeny tiny second. 
let's get that. Let's get that. No problem. Take your time. This is really yeah. amazing stuff. Oh, good. I'm happy folks are feeling, well, at least you're feeling like you're kind of following along and it's just a bad link. I should have checked the dang link because the slides here, of course. Um, okay, there we go. So let me start a slideshow again and share that screen. Okay, here we go. Okay, okay. so I want to talk a little bit about like what variation I'm using in this paper to estimate the effect of travel distance. This map, I really like maps of the US apparently. This is yet another map of the US. And every county is shaded to show you how travel distance changed between 2009 and 2020. If the county is shaded red or pink, travel distance is going up due to provider closures. If the county is shaded green, travel distances are going down because providers opened. So I'm actually using both sources of variation. Like I, I you know, it's all useful to me. The places where distances went down are really interesting. One is because um, crucial providers trust women in Wichita, Kansas that opened during this period uh, following George Tiller's horrible murder. Um, the second thing that is happening is a couple of states are expanding access or, or allowing advanced practice clinicians to provide abortions when they didn't before and expanding access to, telemedic to telemedicine abortion. Those states include Washington State, Maine, New York, among others, and rural providers are able to start providing service as a result. And so that's a big reason, for instance, that Maine has its Maine family planning doing some really cool stuff up there, has some really big increases in access. So I'm going to use not just what happens in Texas, not just what happens in Wisconsin, but what's happening everywhere to kind of re-examine this question of travel distance, check if our earlier results have external validity, and get enough statistical power to know what happens to births. That's the basic idea. There are some tricky problems with the data, of course. Uh, the first is we don't have universal abortion surveillance in this country. So I can only use county level abortions from the states that are reporting them. So I wanna just say it's a big caveat. That's only 33 states I can use. Um, and if you think about which states are, are getting blocked out as a result, I'm graying out the states here where I don't have county level abortion counts and therefore can't estimate the effect of travel distance on abortion in those states. You'll notice California is one of them. California is one of three states that does not publish abortion or surveil at all or publish abortion surveillance statistics at all. So they're not in there. But with the states that I've got, what I can tell you right off the bat is that in the places where no change in travel distance was occurring, abortions were going down part of a secular decline during this period, albeit one that is reversing, right? Well, was reversing up until the reversal of Roe. But in the places where travel distances were going up, abortion rates were going down even more. And the reverse is true in the places where travel distances were declining. To my surprise, in the places where travel distances went down, abortion rates actually went up. Right. So you see there's this, this kind of clear association between changes in travel distance and changes in abortion rates. And here's the one shock and awe slide. This is the variation I'm going to exploit. And if you're a statistics person, I'll just say really briefly, I'm using a Poisson specification because these are count data. There's a lot of zeros in these rural counties. I'm adding controls for um, all sorts of demographic changes in these counties and things like county level poverty, unemployment rates, household ownership. Um, what else is in there? Oh, Medicaid expansion, like all sorts of state policy changes. There's a whole like hassle of controls in there. And if you're a stats person, a Poisson specification is inherently population weighted. So this is like a population weighted model. Also, although I won't show you all of this today, the results are incredibly robust to doing all sorts of different things. Taking the controls in and out doesn't matter. Switching to weighted OLS doesn't matter. Like I could show you a whole bunch of other approaches that yield fundamentally the same conclusion. My outcome variables are abortion rates, 
and birth rates. And for birth rates, I don't have any of the data problems. I'm using all county natality files from the CDC. We have them for every county. Nothing is suppressed. Almost all births are going to be in there. So the, the birth results, I think, are, are like really solid and reassuringly line up with the abortion results that use more limited data. So here's the result. This graph shows you the predicted effect of an increase in travel distance. That's what's on the X axis. And I'm allowing that effect to vary non-linearly because just think about it intuitively. If you have a woman whose nearest provider is next door and it closes and the next nearest provider is a hundred miles away, she is going to experience that hundred mile increase in travel distance differently than a woman who from the very beginning was already 300 miles from a provider and it went to 400, right? Those are two different things. When the nearest provider is already 300 miles away, a lot of women already can't get there and it does not matter. Additional increases in distance don't matter. And we see this really clearly in all of the papers in this literature. It's the initial distances that block people out and they do so in a really big way. If travel distance based on this result goes up from zero to 100 miles, abortions are predicted to fall by 20%. This is a bit smaller in magnitude than the earlier, earlier literature, but I think also like pretty in keeping with it. We also, I find, just me on this one, that if travel distances go up from 100 to 200 miles, abortions fall by 12%. That diminishing marginal effect because 20% of women already can't get there. And when it goes to 200, they still can't get there, right? So it's like this marginal effect. How many more can't get there? So we see pretty big effects of travel distance, right? It really is reducing abortion rates. What's really interesting is we have solid and precise estimates that those effects are carrying through to births. And that in fact, if you kind of line them up next to each other, it looks like about three quarters of the people who can't reach providers are giving birth as a result. And the estimated effect of an increase in travel distance from zero to 100 miles is about a 2% increase in births as a result, which answers like one of the biggest outstanding questions we had, what happens to these women next? And the answer is a whole lot of them are giving birth. Now, I wanna leave lots and lots of room for Q&A and I'm a little short on time. So I am going to skim a couple slides to get to the punchline. What I'm gonna skim partly because I just suspect this isn't going to be really shocking to this audience, but often is to economists. I often spend a whole lot of time telling economists that this type of result is totally believable if you understand the factors that limit people's access to healthcare, and particularly people's access to abortion, because the modal person seeking an abortion is a low-income adult woman who is already parenting children, and who has limited access to credit. A lot of these people are also reporting disruptive life events, like they've just lost a job, they're in an abusive relationship, they've broken up with a partner. They're already in really tough circumstances. Those tough circumstances are often a big part of the reason they're choosing to seek an abortion. And they're also part of the reason they can't reach or find it very difficult to reach providers. Okay, so the last step for us, now that we know that the evidence on travel distance that we have from Texas and Wisconsin is externally valid. We're seeing it in the whole country. And we know that about three quarters of people who don't reach providers give birth. What does this tell us about the end of the Roe era? So my last step is to take the maps of forecasted change in travel distance and take those forecasted changes and use them to predict how many people can't reach abortion providers. And that is the final map that I'll show you. This is a map of the US. Still, it's the case that the states that are outlined in red are the, ban the predicted bans. The providers that are red dots are the predicted closures. And the counties now are shaded by the projected percent of people who would have obtained an abortion if their provider had remained open, but who cannot, who can no longer reach a provider due to the increase in travel distance. And you'll see that some places aren't very affected. Like for instance, Missouri is a banned state, 
with very little forecast change in travel distance. And the reason is they're basically already living in a post-row situation. Their last provider was in St. Louis. The nearest, the next nearest provider is just across the border in Illinois. Not much is happening for them travel distance wise. The same for the Western Dakotas. But if you look at cities in the South and some of the band states in the West, places where they have providers right now, that's where they really get a, a tremendous shock in access and some of the biggest declines in abortion. If you aggregate all of this up to kind of finalize your picture of a post row country, the projection is that in the affected areas, about a quarter of people who want abortions won't get out. And there's going to be about a 3% increase in births as a result. In raw numbers, that would be about 100,000 people who can't get out, who want abortions but aren't getting them, and about 75,000 giving birth as a result. Now, nationally, keep in mind that half the women in the country aren't experiencing a change in travel distance. So if you kind of zoom back out and look at this nationally, then you've got a situation where a lot of people aren't experiencing those changes and the overall national reduction in abortions is about 13%. I've seen and heard people describe that as not much, not a big deal, not much change. People are gonna still get abortions. I guess that's subjective, I don't know. Like I'll deliver the number and, and y'all can interpret, but I would certainly say that 13% reduction is about 100,000 poor women, many women of color, many in the deep South, many in desperate situations who want an abortion and can't reach one because Roe was overturned. I'll end with some quick caveats that I would love to discuss during Q&A, but I will say this all, this forecast depends on interstate travel remaining possible. It's a question mark, might be restricted. This depends on use of mail order medication abortion on the gray market remaining similar to what we've seen in recent years. Maybe it'll increase, maybe it'll be cracked down on, not sure. And this estimated effect finally depends on appointment availability and the providers that remain being able to absorb this, it, this enormous influx of hundreds of thousands of women from the banned states who are trying to get abortions. I'm just estimating what the effect of travel distance is. If the providers can't schedule appointments, if they're just overwhelmed, we could see bigger effects. And I've been working with students to conduct monthly survey funded by the Society of Family Planning on appointment availability. I fed out a baseline in March to 538, which is the screenshotted um, uh, story, but we found that already abortion access was the appointments, it was taking a really long time to get appointments in some areas, like two weeks, or the providers just couldn't schedule at all. My students are finishing the July round right now. They're chatting me right now, even as I talk on Slack. Uh, and I'm feeding that to the New York Times this time. So stay tuned. I'm going to keep feeding data to the New York Times so that we can see what those effects look like. And I will stop there because I would love to answer questions and see what folks think. Dr. Myers, thank you for that amazing talk. Thank you for putting in those caveats. A lot of us have been talking about telemedicine or with the uh, what's been going on in Texas in the last year. Are they going to stop, find uh, creative ways to stop people from crossing states and so on? So thanks for putting that in there. We're, we're, we, it sounds like we don't really know, of course, that's going to play out over the coming months. Thank you for the amazing talk. We already have eight questions, which means we're going to have we're definitely going to have more questions that we'll have time to answer, but I'm going to try to get through as many as possible. For everybody, please uh, check a look at what's already out there and upvote the ones that may be similar to your questions so I can prioritize those. I'm going to start with this first question. Thank you for a superb analysis. Are there data to allow you to factor in medical abortion, illegal abortion, or self-induced abortion? Also, are you able to quantitate the delay in abortion for women who do travel delays add to complications. I might uh, put in there, uh, Dr. Nichols just put in a comment. Uh, he's our chief of uh, pulmonary critical care, um, factoring in also mobile abortion clinics. So a lot of variability is factoring in. Yeah, okay, so I think that's three things. Don't let me forget them. Uh, okay, let's start with delays in care. Um, in the nationwide study, I wasn't able, all of the states weren't publishing um, 
data on gestational age at the time of abortion that I could harmonize to estimate that. But we did look at it in Texas. And what we saw in Texas was a substantial increase in second trimester abortions in 2013 when providers closed. And again, I have a, another paper that Errol mentioned on the effect of mandatory waiting periods that shows that two trip mandatory waits, which require extra travel, substantially increase second trimester abortions. I think it's reasonable to expect that women seeking abortions will be delayed by travel distance and also by appointment availability. Although the extent to which some states enforce gestational age bans might have some kind of interesting and non-intuitive implications for that prediction. For instance, suppose Georgia doesn't enact, enact a total ban. Suppose they enact just a six week gestational age ban. Their providers, will have capacity to absorb patients coming out of band states who are able to get to them before six weeks, even as other Georgia patients past six weeks are flowing out to other states. So it, it could like actually reduce some of the impacts. Okay, so that's one thing. Medication abortion. Medication abortion has been available on the internet throughout this entire period uh, on like kind of a gray market. It was totally available in Texas in 2013. It was being sold at flea markets. Um, you could cross over the border to Mexico and get Cytotec over the counter at Mexican pharmacies. Like it was a thing in Texas in particular. Um, it's available in other places. We can't directly surveil it by its very nature. We can't see it in the data we have. I am looking for it right now in a project that uses, um, I can't say too much about the project, claims data to look for diagnosis codes related to miscarriages and abortions that might reflect some increase in self-managed care. I don't have an answer though yet, but that's really why we looked at the births, right? We can see if these people end up giving birth when, birth when they can't reach providers. And if 75% of them are, we can infer they're not getting a medication abortion. Maybe they'll become more willing to do so. Maybe that information is gonna get out there. There's definitely a lot of effort. It's safe and effective. And at the exact same time, states are looking to crack down on that. And if they find a way to effectively limit it, which is a big if, and the ways they would do it scare me in terms of individual liberties. If they find a way to limit it, then it goes the other way. Mobile clinics is the third. Yeah. They won't have a big effect on this projection. They'll matter, they'll matter for capacity. They definitely should be you know, heading for those borders, heading for those pressure points. But the reality is, Based on what we've seen, a tremendous number of women seeking abortions are prevented from getting there by even 200 miles. Most of the women who can't get there can't get there by the time you've hit 200 miles. The mobile clinics can't get close enough to most of these population centers. So they are going to matter for capacity, for appointment availability. I'm not saying they won't have an impact, but I don't think they'll have a, I would say I'm not super optimistic they'll have a, a large one. Uh, I, the next question by far the most voted is by Dr. Michelle Berry. She's the uh, Senior Associate Dean for Global Health, amongst other things. And Dr. Berry, if we had more time for discussion, she'd be one of the people I'd love to have live up here. But she asks, uh, she says, great analysis and talk. In the post-Roe landscape cross-border abortions, especially for Texas or Mexico being uh, accessed, and, and recently a UCSF professor running protecting reproductive rights of women endangered by, statute, by state statutes, or also called prowless, aims to offer surgical abortions to women in states like Texas, Louisiana, and Alabama via a vessel on federal waters escaping state, state laws. Have you placed this into your distance, cal distance calculations? No, um, I think it could also have a, a substantial effect, but I would go back to two huge questions about it. I mean, we've seen this before. We've seen this in other states, like these vessels have existed. Women on Waves have been doing this for a long time um, in uh, off, in offshore waters for other countries where abortion is banned. Um, I believe the service will be utilized. I believe it'll have an effect, but much like the mobile clinics, the huge question is for, I think a, a, what's gonna happen is a lot of women who otherwise would do things like fly to New York or fly to California, they might, it'll be much easier for them to go closer to a mobile clinic or one of these offshore clinics. And I think they will, and I think it'll benefit them. But for the women who are just fundamentally blocked out by travel distance, 
how will they be able to reach the offshore clinics? It's going to depend so crucially on the organization and, and provision of resources to this group of very poor, vulnerable women. And I think states like Texas are likely to try to crack down on that. And the question is, how effective will the organizers be? And how effective will Texas, like, I'm just waiting to see kind of how this plays out. I think there's gonna be a real battle. Um, and I, I, I can't predict the end. D Dr. Solomon says, you are a national treasure. Have you modeled how <laughs> ramping up plan B availability could mitigate what appears to be a very dismal situation? No, that's a great question. Um, everything I've just modeled is based on current plan B availability. And I think plan B is generally hesitant. I know there's pockets of contraceptive deserts where this isn't true, but I think availability is pretty decent in a lot of these places. It's pretty good. Um, my concern is that maybe what we should be modeling is decreased plan B availability because we're seeing some movement to categorize LARC and emergency contraceptives as, a, as abortifacients um, and try to limit their distribution in some of these states. I would have, I'm still inclined to think that's alarmist and it's not gonna happen, but like Roe just got overturned. <laughs> so um, I, I should, Stop predicting. Um, I think increased access to Plan B would reduce unintended pregnancy and increased communication around it. But the fact remains, unintended pregnancy is very common, even in an era of safe and reliable contraceptives. Dr. Leibowitz asks, have you looked at the effects of these closures on sales of contraceptive, contraceptive products at drugstores or use of IUDs? Uh, yes and no. I have a uh, work in progress, not published, don't have the working paper that uses Nielsen retail scanner data to see how provider closures affect condom purchases. Um, and I'm not ready to go on the record about the result yet, but I would say very generally, I'm everywhere I look, I'm not seeing a ton of evidence of substitution to more effective contraceptives. However, that's me looking at the effect of clinic closures in the past 10 years and asking when somebody's local clinic closes, are they more likely to buy condoms at the drugstore? I think in the last 10 years, a lot of people just weren't aware where their nearest clinic was until they needed it. And so it's not super surprising to me to not see much evidence of a behavioral response because I don't think they knew. But I think a lot of people are aware that Roe was overturned. And I think there's a lot more public awareness of, of decreases in abortion access that may cause women to start investing in, in uh, women and men, people, to start investing in, uh, well, to engage in less risky se sexual practices, I would say. Uh, thank you. I, I, we're hitting, uh, we're, we're just hit 901. I want to mention Dr. I'm Yen. sorry. Yeah. No, you did you great. I just want to, um, Dr. Yen, thanks for uh, sending those uh, website links. I will, um, we'll put them in the uh, email follow up uh, with the recording of this to share with people as well, Plan C pills, as well as reproductiverights.org and some other sites here. Um, Dr. Myers, I want to be respectful of your time since we're at 901 and close it down he here. Uh, any other comments or questions before we, we close down the grand rounds today? Thank, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Again, I can't thank you enough, for, again, for short notice coming here and sharing your expertise. You're not just an expert in this field. You're the expert. So we're really lucky to have you here. And uh, hopefully we can invite you to come back as uh, you do more analysis as we navigate through this whole thing. Sure thing. I'm measuring it all as it plays out. And if anybody has suggestions or comments uh, or wants data, feel free to shoot me an email. I am all about open science and just uh, trying to get as many people working in this field as possible in this critical moment. And I, and I see a bunch of our leadership popping back on video. Again, I just want to thank you all for helping with all these grand rounds. Um, and again, to support doing uh, this time through our community tremendously. Dr. Thank Myers, you. thank you again, everybody. Have a great week. And uh, we'll see you next week.